Well, it's good to see you all. You know, we, we talked about, you know, when to start, uh, get back together. In, in the years past, we would have waited to the end of January to launch this with groups, but I'm thinking we don't need that long of a break. How many of you enjoyed the holidays? How many of you love Christmas? How many of you are glad it's over? How many of you are regular get back into some routines and rhythms? Um, I'm going to encourage you, and I'm not saying this because I'm speaking, but I'm going to share at the men's breakfast, and we're going to talk about life-giving rhythms. And it's just a really good time of the year. Pastor Corey talked about that at his message. You know, what are some things I need to add to my life? What are some things I maybe need to take away? And we're going to talk about that. It's a really good time of the year. <clears throat> um, you know, Dave had a lot of info. One thing I just want to reiterate, whether it's the mission trip, let's say it's a beloved, let's say it's a women's conference, I want to challenge and encourage us men to lead the way <clears throat> in this because it's easy to hear of an event. Let's, you're watching the announcements, and let's say it's a beloved, it's a women's event. Well, you just check out because we're not women, okay? Or it's a middle school uh, retreat. Well, you check out because you're not a middle schooler. Maybe you don't have a middle schooler. But I want to encourage us, and I, I would share this at the church I came from, and I would love for us men to set the tone and lead the way in this. Any event we have here at Cape Christian, we can be involved of one, if not more, five ways. The first is go. If it applies to you, go, okay? Second is invite. Now, I can't go to the beloved the women's conference, but I might be working with somebody in the office that, man, I think you would really enjoy this. I want to invite you to it. The third is serve. You know, when we have these women's conferences, we did this at our, the church in Omaha. We, any women's event, we would get 30, 40 guys, and we would serve the women. So we can serve, whether it's a youth camp or whatever. Four, you can pay, just like Dave just shared. You can pay. Not everybody can go to the Dominican Republic, but I can, I can give 20 bucks to make sure some guy gets there. And then pray. So it's go, invite, serve, pay, and pray. You want to repeat that with me? Go, invite, serve, pay, and or pray. And uh, I would say this, as one of the members of this uh, mission trip, we covet your prayers. There's going to be obstacles. The enemy doesn't like it. We're going to be building a, uh, gonna be building a home for a, a, a teacher at a Christian school. She's living in a dump, and we just want to bless her. I'm hoping so much money comes in via this. We'll fund the guys going, and we'll be able to do some really cool things for her. And uh, <clears throat> I, I just, I think it's really neat that we're able to do that. Uh, another announcement Dave didn't <clears throat> mention, and you're going to be hearing more about it and I want to plug it, start plugging it now, is we are going to be hosting a marriage conference. It's called the XO Marriage Conference. You're going to start, you're going to see it on social media, church announcements. It's Pastor Jimmy Evans, his wife Karen. I've been following Jimmy for 30 to 35 years. This is some of the best stuff on marriage I've ever seen. I've hosted this event in the church in Omaha four or five times. It is a Friday night done by noon on Saturday. It's February 10th and 11th. It's phenomenal, and I will say this. If you have a great marriage and you want it to be even better, go. And if you have a good marriage and you want it to be great, you need to go. And if you have kind of an average or bad marriage and you want it to be good, go. You may have a marriage that, man, you feel like you're done. You need to go. Uh, their story is amazing. You can go online. They have a website called Marriage Today, and uh, their story is amazing. Jimmy Evans, he was a male chauvinist pig. Uh, Karen was an emotional basket case. He was a pastor. They were getting divorced. They were done. God miraculously res uh, resurrected their marriage, and now it's just the way the Lord works. He's, helped, he's used them to help hundreds of thousands of marriages across the world. And so from that, you need to come to the event because we're going to be launching Marriage on the Rock groups out of this. I got men in this room. They're going to be leading marriage groups, and we're going to really want to take, uh, where's Dennis? Sheldon, Dennis, and Natalie, are, they, they're going to be, uh, they're spending my right hand on this marriage thing. We just want, we want marriages. There's nothing under attack more than the nuclear marriage in America. And we want to make sure in this church people have places to go. So we're excited more to hear on that. But 10th and 11th of February, there's no good reason not to come. I, I just want to challenge you. Come. And if you know people who are really struggling in marriage, I want, I'd encourage you to invite them to come as well. Okay. Um, we're going to start, I'm going to launch, I'm kind of introducing and I'm going to do phase one of a series uh, that Dave and I are going to be doing over the next four weeks. Uh, how many of you as Christians you hear, you hear this? You should read your Bible. How many of you ever heard that one? Well, you ought to pray. If you're a Christian, you ought to pray. How many of you heard that one? Really, you should, we should worship. If that's what Christians do, they worship. How many of you heard that one? Have you ever asked the reason Why? My whole life, I was a kid, yeah, read the Bible. We never read the Bible. I think that was for the pastors. And I grew up in the denominational church, and uh, 
you know, we, we didn't read the Bible. We, everybody had one. And, uh, you know, reading the Bible is, is important. We're, we're getting ready for 21 days of prayer starting tomorrow. If you don't have a booklet, as Dave mentioned, we have them on the resource table. Excited about that. But I always like, if I do anything, it's like, why am I doing this? Here's the reality. Reading the Bible, praying, fellowshipping, they're all very, very important. Prayer is very, very important. But why do we do it? We don't do it to check a box. We do it to get closer to Jesus. Because, gentlemen, and I hope you all know this, this is not about religion. It's about a relationship. It's about a relationship with the living Christ that can transform your lives. I don't know all of them. I'm getting to know you guys a little bit, a little bit, a little bit more and more. There's a lot of amazing stories of before I met Jesus, I was. Since I met him, I am a brand new creation. And here's the deal. Jesus changes lives. And we're going to talk about reading the Bible. We're going to do some really practical entrance on what does it look like to study the Bible. But really, at the end of the day, it's not about reading the Bible. It's about finding Jesus and encountering him. And so we're going to, the, the, uh, the title of this series simply is going to be Pursuing Jesus. And we're going to take the model uh, in Acts 2.42. We believe if there's any individual that's the greatest example in the history of the world, it's Jesus. And we think the best example of any church organization in the world was the early church. Acts 2.42. In the book of Acts, we're not going to really study Acts. That would be a great study. I dare you to read the book of Acts and not be fired up. Because the church that we're a part of, again, I'm going to give you the backdrop. We're going to look at a verse here that's going to be our foundational verse every week, and it's Acts 2.42. And we've talked about this before in Cape Men, and it's really a recipe for a spiritually fit Christian. It's a recipe. Every healthy, life-giving church should have these elements in it, and it's this. So the, the backdrop is this. Uh, Jesus said it's going to be better if you go away. I don't believe the disciples believe him. I thought, we don't think it's going to be good if you go, but go ahead. He went. He left. Uh, he spent 40 days walking around after his resurrection. There was a 10-day gap between the time he ascended into heaven and the Feast of Pentecost. The second most important feast was, uh, was Pentecost. It was four, 50 days pente, 50 days after Passover. He said, go. He gave them the commission. He gave them their, the, new, their new commandment. He commissioned them. He gave them his authority. We talked about that in the Identity Series. But he said, go, but wait. I want you to go to Jerusalem and hang out till you be endued with power. From on high. So there were 10 days between the resurrection. And in Acts 2, we see they're all gathered together in an upper room. There was 120 in the upper room. I don't have time to dig it all, go through it all, but you can read it. It's Acts 2. Now, what's fascinating to me, we do know that at one time, 500 people saw Jesus after the resurrection. My question is, where was the other 380? <laughs> I would have been probably the 380. I hung around for two, three days. Oh, we got fish to catch. We got stuff to do. Anyway, there's 120 in the upper room. The Holy Spirit was poured out. They began speaking in tongues. And the church that we are a part of right now was birthed. You see, there wasn't an early church and a latter church. We're in the latter days of the exact same church. And that, that church exploded. So here's Peter. Peter, the gutless wonder, the guy who denied Jesus three times. He gets up and delivers the first recorded sermon in the New Testament. You need to read it. It's amazing. In the end of it, they say about 3,000 people got saved. Back then, they didn't count women and children. That could have been three, anywhere from three to 20,000 people got saved. That's a good first sermon. That's some good preaching, amen? And then we see this, and this is the model. So we're going to look at this, and this is going to be the bedrock of what Dave's going to speak and I'm going to speak about in the next four weeks. Is at the end of the day, reading the Bible, these components are all really important. The Word, and you're going to hear, hopefully you're going to feel it for me, how much I love the Word, but at the end of the day, we don't worship the word of God, we worship the God of the word. And we even see this in, the, in, in John, that he's debating with the, the Pharisees, and nobody knew the Bible better than the Pharisees. Nobody. And he looked at him and said, you search the scriptures, for in them, the scriptures, you will think you will find eternal life. He's saying, boys, the scriptures speak of me. The people who knew the Bible better than anybody didn't recognize the Messiah when he was standing right in front of them. We don't want to be those people, do we? So the whole purpose of reading the Bible, so I can learn, I can grow, I can give it. We're going to talk about all that, but I can get closer to Jesus. But here it is, Acts 2.42. He, he delivers a sermon, and here's the thing, these four things, and we're going to, I'm going to pull out the first one. So that's kind of setting up the series. And what, what a great time of the year to say, you know what, I'm ready to, I, I want this to be the best year of my life. How many of you would like for this to be the best year of your life? <laughs> I don't know of one hand that's not going to go up. You know what, Stovall Weems, he wrote a book called The Awakening. I'm going to talk about it at the men's breakfast. One of the best books on pursuing God, fasting that I've ever read. 
He said, this will be the best year, best year of your life if it's your best year spiritually. As our relationship with Jesus goes, so goes everything else. And I tell you, what, let's face it, we've come out of a couple of years where we've had a lot of distractions and a lot of reasons to get out of the rhythm. And so you need to come Saturday. We're going to talk about those rhythms. But here's what we see, Acts 2.42. And they, the, the disciples, continued steadfastly. I'm not going to unpack that, but that's regularly. It's intentionality. You guys were intentional about coming here. I love that. They continue steadfastly in four things. The apostles' doctrine, that's teaching. It's the word of God. We're going to talk about that tonight. The apostles' doctrine, which is teaching. Fellowship, koinonia. Remember what I shared about koinonia some months ago? That's Christian fellowship. That's, that's that unity. That's that bonding that happens when you meet with another Christian. That, isn't it amazing that you can feel closer to somebody you've known for 20 minutes than somebody you've known for 20 years? But that's that kindred spirit. And the breaking of bread and in prayer. So tonight we're going to talk about the Bible. How do you read the Bible? i got a slide. I think it says the Word of God, the Bible is not a book, but it is a library of 66 books. Where do I start? Have you ever, <clears throat> if you're newer, or if you are newer, it's like, where do I start? I would encourage you. I'm going to walk through some things. you got a handout. There is a ton of material in that handout. Gentlemen, I'm not going to get through it all, but I, <clears throat> I would, I'm going to highlight some things. But we're going to see what the Word says about the Word. <clears throat> I would encourage you, don't read the Bible like a book. <clears throat> Man, if you can pull it off, great. But uh, I tried that once, and I, I about died in the wilderness in Leviticus. It, it's, not, it's not a book. It's a library. And we're going to unpack. Some of this is going to be a uh, review for some of you. Some of this will be brand-new revelation. <clears throat> so this syllabus came out of a curriculum I put together years ago. I just thought, why reinvent the, reinvent the wheel? So I'm going to highlight some things. We're not going to go through it all. <clears throat> but first of all, we're going to look at Scripture. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all Scripture. Say, all Scripture. How much of Scripture is all Scripture? <laughs> all Scripture. Is God-breathed, given by His inspiration, and it is profitable for four things. Doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. We'll unpack that later. 2 Peter 1.21 says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they are moved by the Holy Ghost. And I love Hebrews 4.12. The Word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. <clears throat> I love that verse. In some versions, you're, you're, the, the, the translation will literally say, the Word of God is pregnant with life. See, it's unlike any book ever written because it has the power to change you and me. It has the power to convict us, to draw us, to teach us, to instruct us. It's amazing. I'm going to just jump down there. <clears throat> the writers of the Bible did not speak by natural inspiration or an act of the human will, but as we heard, holy men of God spake as they are moved by the Holy Ghost. So what, what do we take away? The Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible. We see this in John 14, 26. Jesus said, and the Comforter, who's the Holy Spirit, he will teach you all things. See, on Sunday morning, Pastor Corey might deliver, Pastor Cindy might deliver. On Tuesday nights, Dave or I might deliver. We're not the teachers. We dispense information. Then, this is so cool, the Holy Spirit takes that information, says one thing to Randy, says another thing to Bob, says another thing to Dennis, and it's the Holy Spirit is the teacher of the Word. He created the Word. So, the Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible. Man is the instrument used by the Holy Spirit to write the Bible. What are the results? And this is really important. The infallible Word of God. Therefore, the Bible is free from error and absolutely trustworthy. How many of you believe that? I, I, have that, I, I just know it is. Now, I don't understand it all, and there's questions you can ask, but here's the reality. If you don't believe God's word is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, you will be all over the board. And, and look what we've done as a country, how we've moved away from that. It's, it's, it's worked really well for us, hasn't it? Not. Okay, we're going to move on. We're going to talk about the unity of the Bible. I, I know you can read, but I'm just going to kind of go through this. The oneness of the, or the unity of the Bible is a miracle. It's a library of 66 books written over the 350, by 350 authors in a period of approximately 1,500 years. Represented in the authors is a cross-section, I love this, of humanity, educated and uneducated, including kings, fishermen, public officials, farmers, teachers, physicians. Included in the subject are religion, history, law, science, poetry, drama, biography, and prophecy. <clears throat> Yet its various parts are as harmoniously united as the parts of the human body. It's not on your notes, <clears throat> but it has mysterious treasures hidden throughout, but at the same time, it has principles for today. Here's the question. <clears throat> for 35 authors with such varied backgrounds to write on so many subjects over a period of approximately 1,500 years in absolute harmony is a mathematical impossibility. 
It could not happen. How do we account for the Bible? The only adequate explanation is holy men of God spoke as they are moved by the Holy Spirit. I just got to read this because I think this is the coolest little article I found this years ago. And we know this. We're going to talk about this in a bit. The Bible is books. These books were written over a period of time. There were not chapter and verse. We put chapters and verses. Those are like street signs. Well, Cape Coral is a really bad example right now because there are no street signs anywhere. Did you know that after the hurricane, did you notice they got turned 45 degrees? You were going, if you didn't have GPS, you were screwed. I mean, it was the darndest thing I've ever seen. But really, we put, the, we, put, we put the chapters and verses so we can find them. But so think about this, and we, we don't have time to go into how they, the, the canonization of the Bible and put it together. But I love this, and it just shows the math. The, if you're a math nerd, if you're a numbers guy, just Google uh, the, the Bible and the mathematics of the Bible. There's so many things, but I'm just going to read this. The center of the Bible. Did you know? The Psalm 118 is the middle chapter of the entire Bible. And remember, it took thousands of years to put this book together. Did you know the Psalm 117 before Psalm 118 is the shortest book in the Bible, chapter in the Bible? Did you know the Psalm 119 after Psalm 118 is the longest chapter in the Bible? The Bible has 594 chapters before Psalm 118 and 594 chapters after Psalm 118. 118, excuse me. If you add all the chapters except Psalm 118, you will get a total of 1188 chapters. You don't have this information. 1188 or Psalm 118 verse 8 is the middle verse of the entire Bible. Should the central verse, this is the verse that's right in the middle, exactly in the middle of the Bible. Should the central verse not have a fairly important theme? And what does it say? It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. And they're just, I just kind of geek out over that. But there again, what are the chances of that? You, you can't run the numbers on it. The Bible is amazing. Okay, guys, we're going to do this a real quick overview. Overview of the Bible. I'm not going to read this. Uh, I mean, the whole purpose of the Bible is desire to know you and be known by you and the price <clears throat> he paid to have a personal relationship with you. We have the Old and the New Testament. Really, they're properly translated covenants. We have the Old Covenant. <clears throat> I read the Old Testament, but I'm no longer under the Old Covenant. I'm under the New Covenant because of Jesus. Psalm 50, or excuse me, Romans 15, 4, the reason we need to read the Old Testament now, it says those things that were written aforetime were written for our learning, that through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, we might have hope. As you read the Old Testament, it shows you what to do and what not to do. <clears throat> but right now, I'm a new covenant. If you know Jesus, your Lord and Savior, man, I spend all my time in the new covenant. But here we go. The first five books of the Bible <clears throat> of the Old Testament <clears throat> are the books of Moses, um, I'm not going to do all the explanation for the sake of time. The next set is Joshua through Job, is the history books. It's how Israel conquered the land, set up its kingdom. The wisdom and poetry books are next. That would be Psalms through Song of Solomon. They include the honest emotions of writers, telling what they learned from life, their love, and a relationship with God. <clears throat> the prophets. We go <clears throat> Isaiah through Malachi. They're the major prophets and the minor prophets. But they warned Israel of the consequences of turning away from God and his promises. They made predictions about Messiah. Uh, we heard during the Christmas series about the amazing amount of predictions of Jesus being the Messiah, and he fulfilled them all. It's unbelievable. <clears throat> There's a little note there. Read the history books before the prophets so that you can relate their messages to the events and times in which they live. They do have a chronological Bible. It's kind of neat. You know, if you're reading, if you're reading through the, the book of Kings, you get to the you get to the prophets like, oh, well, Jeremiah, that was back over here with these kings. So it's, it is it, it is fascinating. Then, as we heard, there was a long gap. There was a, there was a period of silence. Malachi was the last book of the Old Testament. Then we had the New Testament. And the first four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I love this definition. They're newspaper-like newspaper accounts of the life and teachings of Jesus Christ, written from the unique perspectives of four men who loved him, followed him, and documented his death, his life, death, and return to life. The book of Acts is, tells how the Christian church began and spread to all the world. Again, great study. Uh, I'm finishing up the Gospels. I'm just about done with John, and I'm going to start in on Acts uh, here in a bit, and I can't wait. It's, it's amazing. Then we have the epistles. The epistles are not the wives of the apostles. Just for some in case you're wondering. Epistles are letters. They were letters. Uh, Paul, wrote, Paul wrote many of them. To, they, he, what, what Paul did, he would start a church in like Galatia, and then they find out what they were doing. It's like, oh, guys, you're getting it all wrong. Who bewitched you? You started in grace, and now you're trying to earn your way. Then you'd have to write these letters of correction back to these churches. That's a lot of what, that's what Corinthians is. That's what Thessalonians is, is writing. He established these churches. He was an apostle. Then he wrote these letters back. <laughs> Corinth, they had really big pornography and sex issues. They're having sex with the prostitutes in the temple, and they didn't think it was wrong. He's going, guys, you can't be doing this. 
And so, I mean, it's all there. It's in the book. You should read it. It's fascinating. <clears throat> but he would start, though, and then there's also letters to individuals. So the epistles, I spend a lot of time in the epistles because that shows you and I how we're supposed to live this new covenant life, okay? So they, <clears throat> they're written by their Christian leaders. Um, it's Romans through Jude. Um, then we go to the book of Revelation that reviews human history at its final end, the triumphal return, triumphant return of Jesus Christ and God's amazing promises. <clears throat> it's going to be awesome. Okay, and some of this information here um, we already <clears throat> kind of touched on. You know, Billy Graham made a statement I really liked. He said, you know, when it comes to the Bible, he said, a lot of Christians are like concrete. They're thoroughly mixed up and firmly set. You know, and, and here's, a, here's what I would encourage you. As you study God's word, <clears throat> be open to let the Holy Spirit speak to you. And I would say, here's a big why we read the Bible. is so we can be changed. Romans 12, 1 and 2, I don't think it's in your notes, <clears throat> but Paul makes a statement. He says, I beseech you, and that word beseech, it's a strong word. It's like, I beg you, I implore you, I double dog dare you. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And verse 2, here it comes. And don't be conformed to this world. And don't we know, you just get on social media, you just open up Instagram, TikTok, the world is trying to conform us into its mold. Watch news. It says, don't be conformed to this world. And that's, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna have that exhortation to every man here. Let's not be conformed by this world. And it takes effort, because it happens all the time. Amen? Am I the only one? But, he says, but, say but. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The reason we read the word, the reason we meditate the word, the reason we speak the word is so I can be transformed. That word transform comes from the Greek word metamorphio. We get the word metamorphosis. It's not, the only one I'm aware of where an ugly old uh, caterpillar goes into a cocoon and comes out a brand new creation. That's a butter, beautiful butterfly. Guys, as we submit ourselves to the Word of God, it transforms our lives. And you know what? You know, it's garbage in, garbage out. That's a real old thing. That was an old, old saying. But here's the deal. What are you letting in? What am I looking at? You know, these four openings, ears and eyes, are the portals to my soul. And to be honest, sometimes I get a little lax. It's like, I need to, this is the temple of the Holy Spirit. I need to be careful what I let in there. Okay. All right, let's keep, uh, keep going. I got so, I just got to keep going. Okay, <clears throat> on these notes, we're going to bring it in for landing because I want you guys to have some uh, <clears throat> little discussion time <clears throat> where I look at wrote Hebrews 4 through, 4 through 12, uh, statements about the Bible, over <clears throat> page 17 <clears throat> at the bottom, real quick, and then I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to go to about, about 30 minutes of table time, and then we're going we're gonna to come back. Um, one thing I do want to hit on, two things we, as I wrap this up, is it's really important to know the difference between <clears throat> the logos or the logos of God's word and the rhema of God's word. Romans 10, 17 says this. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Everything we receive from God comes by faith. Our healing, our, our salvation, our righteousness, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's all received by faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There's two definitions for the word word. The first is logos or logos, how, depending on how you like to say it. It is the written word. It's like the written word. It's like the, the paper. We're looking at the logos, and that's where we get the word logo. What are some of the most famous logos out there? Probably the swish, Nike. I mean, that's where we get that term. It is a literally written. Yeah, I would love that. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's the written word. We need the written word. I read this in the logos. It shows me how to treat my wife. It shows me how to love my neighbor. It shows me how to treat my employees. It, it, sh it shows me how to treat my fellow brothers in Christ. I mean, it's in here, guys. So we need to be renewing our mind on the logos. But there's another word for the word, word, and it's rhema. Say rhema. Rhema is a specific word to a specific person at a specific time. And I know you gentlemen, some of you had this happen. I've read the Bible for, I've been reading it for a lot of years. And, you know, I'll read a verse, and maybe I've read that verse 123 times. And so, yeah, that's good. It's good stuff. And then on the 124th time, I'm reading it, and it's like, explodes. It's like, oh, my gosh, I never saw that. That's the Holy Spirit. That is God speaking to you. It becomes revelation. He reveals 
his word. Here's the reality. The more time, guys, here's the reality. This is the way it works. The more time I'm in the logos, the more opportunity the Holy Spirit has to turn into rhema. It's kind of like showing up for class. If I can't learn anything if I don't show up for class. When I get up, sometimes in the morning, it's me and Jesus and the coffee, and I'm, I'm tired. I'm kind of reading, and yeah, that's good. I've read that before. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit speaks. I love that. Revelation. I call that heavy revy. Who doesn't want some heavy revy? Lord, speak to me. And he encourages us with his word. He challenges us with the word. He convicts us, but it's all so, so good. And the last thing I'm just going to, uh, this is another whole lesson in and of itself. <clears throat> it's page 18, but um, if, if, how many of you are familiar with the armor of God? We see that in Ephesians. There's an armor of God. Um, it's really fascinating. That's a great study. We could do a six, seven, eight week series on that. But it's really fascinating. If you study the armor of God, Every piece of that armor is defensive except for one. And this is it. It's the sword of the Spirit. This gentleman, this is where we do battle with the enemy. When he lies to you with those vain imaginations, yeah, I remember back when you did that, they'll never love you, God can never forgive you. All, all the things he tries to do is those little, those fiery darts. He talks about the fiery darts of the enemy. Those are thoughts from the enemy. I, I can't explain it, but it's part of our unredeemed nature. I'm born again. I got a spirit that's alive to God. We've talked about that with spirit, soul, and body. But I still, how many of you had this happen? It's happened to me this weekend. I love Jesus, love my wife. And I, I heard a song from the 70s. It's like, oh, that was fun. I remember those days. Those were the good old days. And those weren't the good old days because there was a lot of crap that happened. And I have, to, I have to take authority over those thoughts. And the Bible says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. What, is, what does Paul say in Philippians? He says, whatever is pure and lovely of a good report, think on these things. And I've had to do that because your mind, I mean, we, we're all over the place, and we live in such a visual world. I mean, we have, we have pictures all of everything in the world. And I'll never, Kenneth Hagin, anybody remember or know who Kenneth Hagin was? Great man of faith. He was an amazing evangelist, preacher, teacher, and in his own kind of heads, homespun uh, country way. He said, you know, you can't keep a bird from flying over your head, but you can keep them from keep building a nest in your hair. So here's the reality. Why am I saying that? Those thoughts come and go. But we, when those thoughts that are from the devil come, I have a decision to make. Am I going to entertain them? It's kind of fun. I'm going to say, no, in the name of Jesus, I cast that down. You know who is our best example of that? And I'm going to close with this. <clears throat> Jesus, when he started his ministry, he got baptized by his, by his cousin in the Jordan River. He was led in the wilderness for 40 days, no food, no water. And Satan came and tempted. It's in Matthew 4. You just need to go read it. Satan came and tempted Jesus. And here's the reality. Everything Satan tempted Jesus with, he could have done. But you know what? He had to do something that you and I could do. When, when Jesus said, you know, Satan said, hey, if you're who you say you are, turn that rock into a piece of bread. You know what? Jesus could have done that, but you and I can't do that. And he left us a model. Guys, this is one of the most important things. I heard this, uh, Tony Evans, anybody knows who Tony Evans is? I heard him preach this at a Promise Keepers about 25, 30 years ago. It was one of the most powerful things I ever heard. And he talked about, if you want to punch the devil in the mouth, you need to hit him. And when Jesus was tempted by Satan, he said, every time, three times, Jesus, Satan tempted Jesus. He said, it is written. Word of God, final authority. Satan tempted him again. You know what Jesus did? Do you know who I am? No. He said, it is written. Third time, Satan tempted him. You know what Jesus did? I think you're getting it now, right? He said, it is written. And Satan left him till an opportune time later. Here's the deal, guys. <clears throat> the devil's going to come until Jesus comes back or we go to be with him. And so we need to learn. And we're going to talk more in the next week's you know, memorize the scripture, but you need to have some bullets in your gun. I mean, when he comes, how many have ever had fear come on you? Every one of us has. You didn't all raise your hands, but in some way, 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, for God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So when those things come, when you speak the word of God, it's like Jesus shutting the door on the devil's face. We need to hit him. Say hit him. Hit Say like you mean it. Hit him. So we're going to go to discussion time. I went longer than I was going to. We're going to take about 20, 25 minutes, half hour. Uh, you got the, here we got these questions. Um, and here's the deal. Table leaders, you can use any of these I give you. If you got one better, feel free to use that. But when the Bible can be a bit overwhelming as you explore it, what have been your thoughts about the Bible in the past? What are they now? Second question, 
What is your biggest challenge when it comes to reading the Bible? Third, has God spoken to you through his word? You might explain that. I would add one, and this might be the, the best of all these, is, uh, you know, we're going to talk more about, uh, we talk about a devotional life. What is, what is a quiet time? How many of you, that was kind of new language when you first kind of came to Christ? It's like, what's a quiet time? Do I just sit in the room and be quiet? Or what? I don't know what to do. <clears throat> what is a, what is a, what does pursuing Jesus look like? I think it would be really cool at your table. I've been a part of groups like this. What, what does your time with Jesus look like? I'll, I'll just be honest with you guys. You need to be intentional. If, if you don't do that now, start with one minute. Start with two minutes. Start with five minutes. I've been doing this for 40 years. He gets a pretty good chunk of my time, first time of the day. It's a non-negotiable. For me, it's him time, gym time. It's just my life is better. I'm, I'm nicer. I'm a better person when I do that. I am. You don't want to be around me unless I've been with Jesus, I guarantee you. But what does that look like? And I think as we share, we're going to encourage each other. And whether you've been walking with the Lord for 50 years or you're just trying to figure out if you even want to have a relationship with him, I think it would be really good. This is not about religion. It's not about checking a box. It is about doing the things to position me so I can know my Savior better than I ever have. Okay? Sound good? Okay, you got about a half hour, and then we'll come back and wrap it up.